Abate la rimette dentro, esce Radu, porta vuota. Gol! Gol! Abbiamo battuto il gatto vero! Li abbiamo battuti tutti Alessio! Grande Alessio! È bella la vita! Lava quella zolla Alessio! Lava la quella zolla Alessio! Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Semper Milan podcast. Uh, I'm going to be your host today, Anthony Torgrud. You can find me on Twitter at Torgrud45. Um, Ollie Fisher, he's he's a little sick right now, so we're not going to have him today. Um, but we got Madison and a very special guest with us. Uh, Maddie, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm excited for this week's episode. Um, Oliver, unfortunately, lost his hearing, so he will not be joining us. You guys can go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Madison underscore DT. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know our special guest, it's Matthew Santangelo. Um, he's the co-host of the State of Play podcast. He's been published in these 40 times, featured in The Guardian, uh, AS Roma, International Champions Cup. Uh, he's, he's a pretty big deal. So, Matt, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you. It's great to be back on, guys. Happy New Year. And I know this is the first uh, guest appearance for 2020, and I'm, I'm glad to be back on and talking about Milan after a victory, of course. Yeah, it's always a nice change of pace when we actually have a win to discuss, or we're usually down in the dumps, so... Um, it's a nice change, but yeah, we, we got a lot of games to cover today, so we'll just jump right in it. Like you said, we had a, a 2-0 win this weekend. Um, change of formation, change of personnel. We had, obviously, Zlatan's debut from the start. Uh, him and Liao scored a goal. Initial reactions, anyone? What are your thoughts? Super excited to see Zlatan and Liao both score. Um, other than that, I think the team played very well. Um, Zlatan's celebration was super humble, but it was, at the same time, it was, you know, perfect celebration for him. I thought he was going to get his second one, but he was about a body offsides, so well, leaning offsides, you know. But um, I think that the 4-4-2 looked very good. Um, without any wingers, we kind of looked more put together, surprisingly, because we have been playing the 4-3-3 for, what, like two or three seasons now? Um and I was a little bit worried to not have Suso on the field, even though he's been in such poor form. But I thought we looked surprisingly well without him. Yeah, I agree. And uh, you mentioned Slatin's celebration. Uh, one thing he did say after the game was that he wasn't going to celebrate there. Um, he's going to celebrate like a god at San Siro. So, you know, hopefully we see that pretty soon and we'll see what that means for him. But, but yeah, I like the way we looked without uh, traditional wingers. You know, we ha- obviously had a right mid and a left mid, but... Um, everything was a lot more direct playing through the strikers, and, and it seems like that's something that they want to do moving forward. So hopefully we keep it and we keep having success. Uh, Matt, anything particular you saw from the game? Uh, yeah, I know, I know you guys touched on uh, Leao and Ibrahimovic, of course. The two goal scorers, they're going to get much of the attention. But I thought Kessier had probably his best performance of the season. Uh, he's come under heavy criticism. Um, you know, There's some speculation about him being sold. Some people just don't want him anymore. Um, I thought that performance was uh, as something he very much needed. And perhaps it's something where if he does play along Benacer in a, in a 4-4-2, I think you could see that being very effective going forward. I think it allows Benacer to be um, able to progress the ball, move the ball, move the ball a little bit quicker and kind of push up a little bit more where Kessie could sit back, um, bust up play, kind of play that Bakayoko role that we saw last year, which um, it seems as though we were missing for most of the season. I think part of what, puts Benacer in those situations where he gets a lot of yellow cards is he's having to play a, a high defensive role too um, in addition to his playmaking ability so I think for me that was a, a really good refreshing scene in the midfield of course I thought Castellejo um, I know I think there's a lot of discussion about Suso but I thought Castellejo added a dimension to the team where we can play much quicker we can move the ball uh, further up the p- up, up the pitch and get guys like Leao and Ibrahimovic in those positions we want and even though, even more so with Castellejo on the offensive side, I thought he did a really good job tracking back. It's something that Suso has also been heavily criticized for. Uh, he just doesn't have that that work rate, that speed to kind of go back and forth. Where you saw with Castellejo, I think he had something like four or five tackles according to who scored. So he did a lot um, in the in the closing stages of the game too, and he really played a complete ninety. And I think Castellejo. Um, won over a lot of people in that performance. But overall, I was very pleased. I thought Teo Hernandez was, was still good. Um, and I think it was one of the better performances as a collective unit for Milan the entire season. Now, do you guys think that that's the change of formation or Zlatan kind of helping lead the team and showing some leadership and discipline from a player on the field? What do you mean? Do you mean like that? 
the position change was Latin's idea, or are you asking if no, that was the only thing? No, not. Do you think that us playing better was a formation change, or do you think that Zlatan's leadership and like discipline towards the players? Uh, I personally think it's it's a combination of both. You know, obviously the formation worked well with how we wanted to play moving forward with whatever the game plan was. Um, but I also think just having Zlatan's presence, you know, everyone knows his personality, what he's going to bring to the table. And I think having a lot of young guys like we do are going to benefit from that, whether it be from the fear of Zlatan, you know, pip- piping up and chirping at them or um, the desire to impress a player of his caliber, whatever it may be. I think his presence and charisma alone is enough to really – brighten the spirits of everyone else you know we saw in his um his official debut when he came in at around i believe the 65th minute mark last time out uh everyone looked pretty poor up to that and then uh, magically everyone was faster they were um, moving forward more th- and they played to the final whistle something that usually when we're not in a winning position we turn off around like the 85th minute or so and we played to the very end both in that game and this game so i do think latin's presence is a, a big factor in, in formation i'm sorry in our current form um, but I do think also that the game plan from Pioli and the formation itself, it just it worked perfectly in this situation. And I think we might see that moving forward. Um, I don't know. Do you guys think we're going to keep it? I, uh, I think, think so. I, I think we are, too. And I think, um, you know, when Ibrahimovic arrived, I don't think it was something as simple as, hey, we're getting a striker. He's going to be just another one of those guys. I think when you bring in a guy like Ibrahimovic, who's a serial winner, who has won everywhere he's played. I think Pioli would values uh, very much his input on the training ground and the build up to matches. And, and I think that's what's kind of coming in here, because if you notice some of the quotes from certain players like Leao and Hakan, they're, they're, they're speaking very highly of Ibrahimovic. And I think it's one of those things where they're already kind of feeling that vibe around Ibrahimovic and kind of really upping their game. And, and this is what we kind of expected from him, right? I know it's only been a game in 35 minutes, as you mentioned, Anthony, but this is what we expected from Ibrahimovic. What the same thing what we saw in the first stint, where guys like Nocharino, uh, Pato, you know, Boateng, all these guys just kind of raising their game to Ibrahimovic and to match him. And I think that's really what you want to see um, at this spell of the season. Remember, we have a pretty light schedule coming up, so it seems as though if that if Milan are able to. Uh, pick up momentum and go on one of their uh, traditional winter runs that they've seen to go on, this would be the time to do it. And I think they're nine or 10 from fourth. And look, I, I know the top three spots are kind of more or less kind of solidified, if you will, whatever the rotate, whatever the order may be. But I still think there's fourth position is still up. I think Atalanta, they're going to have a skid where they kind of maybe drop points and it's going to be ultimately up to Milan to take advantage of that. So time will tell, but overall I'm, I'm liking the way uh, the team is reacting to Ibrahimovic and his presence. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, you mentioned this this uh, run of games moving forward. It obviously, it starts with Udinese, but the next three before we go into the Derby is they're really winnable games, games that mm-hmm. we expected to win at the beginning of the season. You know, this this upcoming fixture on the weekend at Udinese is the reverse of uh, week one. So we're, we're at that halfway point. And just comparing where we were that initial week under Jim Paolo and, and that formation, that mentality, as opposed to this most recent game, uh, I think we're going to see a totally different approach going into the weekend. And um, I, I honestly, I do expect us to go away with this run with all nine points going into the Derby and hopefully riding that momentum into it. Um, I know that's high hopes given interest current form, but uh, I don't think it's out of question. And um, Even with GGO under, injured? Yeah, so um, actually let's go back to that because we, before the Udinese game, getting a bit ahead of myself, we have a cup game. Um, against Spall, and that's the one that Gigi is probably going to miss. But I, I, to my knowledge, it's not a severe injury, right? Like he's just going to miss this game, maybe the Udinese one at the weekend. Um, but we just brought in a new backup keeper. So do we throw him in right away? Do we let Antonio Donnarumma take over? Um, I'm personally, I'm a big fan of Begovic. Uh, I watched him at Chelsea. Obviously, he didn't play much there. Um, didn't watch him much at Bournemouth because I don't watch Bournemouth games. But I know he he scored a goal for them, so that was impressive. But yeah, Begovic is awesome. Um, do we think he starts, though? That I'm not sure. But I think it's a, a good opportunity to put in some rotation players. Maybe give the, um, our new center back signing, I'm going to butcher his name, Simon Kahir. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but yeah, maybe give him a chance. I don't know. What do you guys think? Does Begovic start? I, has he been playing for Bournemouth? Is is like he in game form? I don't know what in game form means for a goalie, but um, on and off, to my knowledge. I mean, I like I said, I don't watch much of them, but 
He's made like 68 appearances, I think, something like that. Is our only other option Donnarumma's brother? I believe so, yeah. I'd start Bregovic. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, I think in this game, I are, are Milan home in this this game? I, 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 yes. It, it escapes yeah. memory. If they're home, I wouldn't have an issue starting Antonio Donnarumma. I think defensively, <laughs> Milan hasn't been as bad. I know it sounds strange, but they've had spells where I think they can – uh, go on again. They can kind of put it together at this point in time. Have a good defensive record. They've had that in the two previous uh, winter spells, if you will. I wouldn't have an issue of putting in a guy like Antonio Donnarumma. I think you know he had that great performance against Inter in the, uh, yeah, a couple mm-hmm. seasons ago. Pro Battaglia. Um I think it was a clean sheet, if I'm correct. I think he maybe it was. Two it was appearances that I think year. It was I think overtime too. Yeah, yeah, it was the yeah. it was the, the Trone winner, if I'm correct. So yeah. I, I, overall, I mean, I, I wouldn't have any issues with either. I think again, Begovic, he's like, he's a young kid. He's he's seasoned. He's been around the block. I think he's um, has the experience where he can step in and he'll do a job for Milan and hopefully Milan take care of business because I think again at this point in time they're heading in the right direction. I'm more interested to see, I guess, what the rest of the squad looks like. Um, does Pioli rest in certain players? Does he give, to your point, the new signings uh, an actual start in this one? Does he maybe go with uh, Piontek? I know people are talking about that. He may even start in that game, you know. So time will tell, but I wouldn't have an issue going with either of the two keepers. You just want to make sure that GGO is uh, fresh and he's ready Mm -hmm. to kind of give you the rest of the season um, at full form. Yeah, I think that it's really likely that we see Piontek. You know, for everything that Zlatan is, Another thing that he is is a 38-year-old, and to expect him to start a game on Saturday and start another game on Wednesday and start another game next Saturday, it's unrealistic. And I do think we'd see either a combination of Leal Piontek um, or just go back to a 4-3-3 with Piontek up top for this game. I mean, we're playing Spall. Obviously, they're 20th in the league right now. This is a cup match, but still, um, this if there's any game that you could rest your star players, this would be the one. No disrespect to Spall, but it's just positioning wise it makes the most sense that this would be the game you would take the lightest so um, you, you also may see a 442 with um if they kind of want to stick with that that this this 442 formation you you may see a 442 at piontech and layout i think piontech mm-hmm. and layout something i still want to see more of i think we didn't really get much of it because john paulo ditched it after one game to see two strikers up top but i wouldn't be opposed to seeing a 442 at piontech and layout because i think layout is again he has that technical aspect where he can drift wide like he has done in previous games cut in and and you can allow piontech to maybe kind of just kind of be secluded to the box and, and clean up, which hopefully he has some opportunities. But um, I, I don't know if they're going to see a 4-3-3. Uh, regardless, I do think we'll probably see um, – I think we'll probably see Ibrahimovic get a rest because he played the full 90 too. So. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely – I was playing 96 minutes, I think. Yeah. yeah. It was a lot. I definitely think that we're going to see the 4-4-2 only because we're not going to have a, a whole new starting 11. So a lot of the starting 11 are going to be our starters, um, and you want them to be – as familiar with that formation as possible. So I think switching back to the 4-3-3 would just confuse them. And, you know, you want to keep the consistency going forward, especially with Liao. If you want him to be a starter with Ibra up top, there's no point in playing a 4-3-3 and either benching him or putting him on the wing just because then his, you know, he's a young guy. You want him to play in one position and not, you know, get mm-hmm. confused and have different forms, I guess you could say. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, one thing that uh, Castillejo said in an interview this week was that, you know, uh, uh, players know their role regardless of the formation, that it doesn't matter as much. And and I kind of understand where he's coming from, but I also disagree because, like you guys said, there's reasons behind the formations. Matt, you mentioned why Piontek would do better in a 4-4-2 with Liao, and I completely agree with you. I think the formation does make a big difference. And so – you're right. Um, if if we're going to be using this 4-4-2 moving forward, then we should probably stick with it for the cup game, even uh, midweek. But do you think we throw in youth players or anything like that? Maybe give Gabia a chance. Um, uh, Brescianini in the midfield, Maldini maybe up top with, with Leao or Piontek. What do you guys think of that? I think they might come in later on in the game. I don't think that they'll start. Um, Gabia maybe from the start only because he – I'm pretty sure he's been practicing with the first team – so instead of throwing in the new loan signing, have him start from the beginning, see how he does, and then um, sub. I would definitely love to see uh, Maldini, and then I think that there's a midfielder who's been practicing yeah, with Chandini. the first. Yeah, um, I'd like to see him as well. 
sorry guys. Uh, I'm not used to leading the leading the charge here. That's usually all his deal. So I got to look at notes. He doesn't. He's got the game plan down. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, but, but yeah, I, I agree. Um, as far as we'll see, <laughs> we got gonna... Udinese this weekend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could go back into detail on that. Sorry, I'm all over the place right now. Yeah, I don't want to throw you off the notes, but. <laughs> I know. It's honestly, it's so much easier without notes. Notes like you feel like you have to follow them to a tease. You're like, did I skip anything? And, and mm-hmm. yeah, well, you know what? I'm turning the notes off right now. No notes. We're off. We're Make unhinged. it organic. Make it yeah. Screw you, always exactly. notes. Or always notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, for the Udinese game, I'm assuming we're going to see the 4-4-2, exactly what we saw with Samu up top. Or up top. Um, Samu on the wing. And, well, do you think we'll see Musakio? I mean, I... I don't know what our game plan is with this new defensive signing. I mean, I think he's going to be a backup, but given the form that Musaki has had over the last season and a half, like, I don't think it's unrealistic to think someone could overtake him in training in just a week. Is it, do you guys I also that? don't think that Musaki has been as bad as people say. Remember last season, we had one of the best defenses in – like from, from like December to February or, you know, mm-hmm. like he, he has the skill and does he make stupid mistakes? Yes. Is he world-class? No, we don't really have any world-class players. We have Ebro who's a former world-class player. Uh, but I think to switch things up at the back line, especially if Donnarumma is out injured, you want that back line as steady as can be with a new goalie coming in i think it's a lot's gonna do i think you we could see uh, uh kr however you want to pronounce his name i think you could see him play midweek i think that'll give us um and and pioli kind of a good temperature a good reading of, of how fit he is how uh match ready he is if you will and i think that can be a good test for pioli to see going forward how he tends to utilize him i think Musakio isn't safe. I think there's very few players in this squad that are safe and their job is secured. Obviously, we saw Suso, right? He's was uh, as safe as you could probably imagine for the past couple of years. And now all of a sudden, it seems as though Castileo may be taking his spot, right? And there's a lot of rumors about Suso's uh, exit. But I think the, the, the time to see whether or not you want to consistently continue to go with Musaki would be midweek. I think we could, again, to you guys, you were, we touched on previously, see some debutants, kind of get a feeling of things because it's ball, you're at home, you got to assume that Milan are going to take care of business. And then I think that ultimately give uh, Pioli a little bit of an idea of what he wants to do for the home game on Sunday, which is uh, on at least on the East Coast, a 6.30 game, which I know we do really yeah, bad. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> so I'm hoping, yeah. but you know, I, I, I guess it remains to be seen. But I think ultimately Wednesday's uh, 11 will drive the ship. Because as you get to the second half of the season, you really got to start to dig deep and utilize a lot of those players. And if you look at the players that Milan have, you know, right now, Rodriguez is not going to be used. He's Barini's gone. You have a lot of these players that are either gone, not going to be not in, in the equation. So you have to start looking down to your bench. And I think you could even see a guy like Krunic midweek. So uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see. But I think Wednesday will be a good uh, indication of where we expect uh, you know Pioli to go with his lineup on Sunday. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And, and you know, we actually got a question kind of regarding uh, Pioli's tactics moving forward here from, I'm going to butcher this name too, Nuraziz Octavian. I, I apologize, man, but, um, you know, question from him. He said from the last match, I still see Pioli had a lack of tactical options um, while at a deadlock. And, come, and I think Milan need a versatile player to change the game, the game plan in the middle of a game. Any idea for a versatile player that would be good for us? So um, basically what he's saying is he he doesn't see when we're in a tough spot, middle of a match, what we could bring on the bench to change it up, change the game plan and move forward. Um, Do you guys have anyone that you would like to see in mind come in? I think it's you. I think I mean, if we're if we're talking currently, at least on the roster, I think we've this entire podcast, we still haven't mentioned Bonaventura. Um, I know he had a pretty difficult game, pre, you know, a couple of previous games, but I think he's that type of player where you can play him as a winger. He is creative. You can play him in a midfield three. You can play him in a midfield four, either centrally or as a left mid, um, assuming, of course, they don't want to go at Hakan, which he didn't really stand out, in my opinion, at least on the weekend, although he was not too bad. But um, I think if you're talking internally, I think Jack seems to be that guy, and he has been that guy really since he arrived to Milan. Um, but the market's an interesting thing because I, you know, for years we've lacked 
um, that playmaker, that game changer off the bench where you can expect the guy to come in for 20 minutes, you know, pull the strings, make it, have a great influence in the final third. Um, we're, we're hearing rumors of Politano. We're hearing, you know, we heard Boga, who I think would be a, a great player for Milan as a winger if they're still looking in that direction. But um, it's, it's really tough to say. I think ultimately Milan are going to try and move some pieces before they actually look to add, I think. Now that we got uh, Reina, we have Borini, um, Rodriguez is probably on his way out. I think we'll start to see some things kind of heat up um, in the areas of that Milan desperately needed, of course, in the midfield and in the winger department. So, so far, I would probably say as of right now, it's Jack would be that game changer. Yeah, well, well, like one, it. one person we didn't mention in that thing was uh, Paqueta. You know, he seems to be almost out the door as well with uh, PSG. You know, this doesn't really mean anything, but you see it mentioned all the time in rumors. He followed PSG on Instagram. The only clubs he follows are uh, Milan and now PSG. So, you know, take that how you want. But we know that there's negotiations with Leonardo for him to leave. And um, if he does, so be it. But if not, I think he still has a spot in the squad. You know, I, I don't know how he would do in a... Um, a four-man midfield like we have it set up now, he, he needs to be more creative and dynamic, and playing him on the left just puts him too close to that winger position, I, I believe, and it might cause some trouble there. But um, I, I don't know. Do you guys think that he might be able to help with come in late game? I w- I, from what we've seen of him, he's much better from the start than coming off and trying to mm-hmm. catch up to the pace of the game. So I'd rather see him start, but I just don't know who I would bench for him at the moment, only because he has not shown what his promise is supposed to be. I would much rather Bonaventura start with Castillejo um, than Paqueta start. Um, I mean, maybe, I mean, you can train him to be able to catch up to the game speed, but um, I feel like we're in a very delicate season this season, and if everything goes right, we have a slim chance of getting that fourth spot. Um, and based on the last 10 years, it probably won't happen, but you know, never we'll say believe- never. Yeah. We are uh, believers. So I think believers. We'll pro- I- <laughs> you're a I believer think, i think with paqueta you know I, I i feel for the kid because i think he's been uh mishandled his the whole entire situation with him has been mishandled you know you have um you know we had Gattuso when and he did really well early on when he came in last january then you get rid of him and under john Paolo, he didn't really play that much or play well at all then they have a formation change and then he was kind of ousted now pioli doesn't see him as 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 a key man right now so for you to put all that on a young player who's coming from Brazil to a vastly different league in Serie A and expecting him to be the finished product after you spend $35 million on him, I just think it's been one of those things where I wouldn't want to see him kind of be uh, sold so early. I think it's got to be one of those things where, you look, you spend the money on a player of that caliber, of that quality, who had interest from Liverpool, PSG, all these big clubs, find a way to integrate the kid. You don't want to, you don't want to be that team that, that gets him lets him go for peanuts, and then he's a star at PSG. Because I think he's got that upside. He's got that potential. We see it in, in quite a bit for, for, for Brazil. He's wearing the number 10 shirt. There's something there. He's, there's quality that's not being tapped into. And I would love to see Pioli at least try to give the kid a shot. Uh, maybe it's midweek. Again, I think it's a great test for him to kind of get a start from the, from the very beginning. As you uh, mentioned uh, at Madison, that he tends to do better in those situations versus coming off the bench. But there's got to be a role for this kid because you can't spend $35 million on him, $35 million on Piontek, and just completely sell them uh, less than a year later for less than what you paid for. That's just not good business for Milan, and it'll be something that kind of maybe deters other players of their age um, and abroad from coming, right? Uh, you can't expect to give up on a guy like Paqueta so soon and then want to quickly go to Gremio and say, hey, Everton, come with us. Well, look how you guys handled Paqueta, you know what I'm saying? So. It's got to be one of those things where Milan has to, has to create an environment where it's good for youth players to come in. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, there's players 24, 25 that maybe does a little bit better. But you got if you're going to have an emphasis on a youth project, create an environment where they can succeed and they're going to get the quality. And it's seeing it with Liao, I think there's a, rock, a role for Paqueta to play the second half of the season. I definitely agree. Um, I would like to see him play with... Ibra, though, rather than Piantic, because I think Ibra will be able to boost his confidence way more only because Piantic has been awful all season long. Yeah, I, th- I think his league of play with uh, Zlatan would be incredible for him. Obviously, it never hurts a player to have Zlatan up top for you. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, we got we got to find a spot for him. Like you said, it, I think there was a huge expectation going into the season because of his half season he had with us last year. He was feeding balls to a highly informed Piontek who was <laughs> bagging goals every single game. So it made everyone believe that Paqueta was capable of doing these incredible Kaká level things. And now that we see Piontek's form dropping, we're starting to see that parallel with uh, Paqueta going down as well. And I think it's kind of making people turned off a little bit when they shouldn't be. It's just a dip in form, um, or not even a dip in form so much as just he do- he doesn't have the end product. You know, we, we know he's not scoring goals. He but he's also not getting a striker that is scoring the goals. So his assists aren't coming. His numbers are getting hurt because of everything else as well. So um, you're right. I think he's just been mishandled and. You mentioned the money. It doesn't make sense to sell him for less than we bought him for. So why should we do that? Um, I, I don't know. I think well, where do we play him though? Because I just don't think he's going to fit in a four-man midfield like that next to Benacer. It's not going to work. Put him where Castillo plays. I think that he's more of a midfielder than Castillo is. Even though, like Matt said, he had a great game this past weekend. Um, I do think that Castillo is more of a winger. And Paqueta could play more of a midfield role and be stronger in the midfield than Cassiejo. Well, here's the thing with Paqueta is that when he at the beginning of the season, when you know when John Paulo was was on the bench, they they obviously everyone talked about the four three one two and how certain players will integrate into that system. Paqueta's been steadfast, committed to saying that he's a number ten. I this is where I feel the most comfortable. So I, with that in mind, I think if you do play a 4-4-2, as Madison alluded to, and you, consi- you continue down this road, you can do something where, again, dare I say, something like a Christmas tree formation where you have a guy like Ben Asser who can, is accustomed to playing a little bit deeper. He can clean up. He can mop up. You have coverage in the back with four guys. But you also have that work rate with Casalejo where he does track back on like Suso, so you've got coverage there. Can you have a guy like Pocket to play more or less um, uh, off uh, Leao and Ibrahimovic and be sort of a, a, a number 10, if you will, in a 4-4-2. That's something I'd like to see because if you're going to play Pocket wide, it's I don't think it's going to work. If you're going to play him um, strictly as just a regular midfielder, like a Jack type or like a Kessia type, and ask him to do so much defensively, I think you have to play to his strengths, and his strengths are when he's in the final third. I think we're not really quite seeing that, and I don't think he's been given the opportunity to show what he's capable of because – all the jokes and all the memes being made about Paqueta being, you know, kind of like, you know, doing too much with the ball, kind of shielding the guy. He's that's he can do that, but you don't pay 35 million for a number 10 who plays in an attacking role for Brazil for him to do that. You want him in the final third. You want him making that final pass to Leao, making that final pass to Ibrahimovic in space where they can finish. So that's where we have to see Paqueta, and I think that's where you'll kind of get the best out of him because I think he's got more in his game than we're seeing. And I think it, it's, it's only being wasted by him playing out of role out of position. Now in that hypothetical Christmas tree that you mentioned, I, I like the idea of it, but do you think having him forward more leaves a, a gap in the midfield that Benacer would have to work double? I mean, do, do you think he'll be capable of doing that? Um, I, I think he, I think he can. And I think there's also, there's also things in Pocketa's game. I don't know if you guys uh, knew anything about him coming to Milan, but he had some pretty good defensive metrics at Flamengo. Again, I know it's a different (laughs) league, but he was a guy that was among the best in the league at interceptions and winning the ball in the air. So he does a lot of those things. He's not just strictly like a Coutinho type where, okay, where you're expecting him to just be a free kick guy, just, you know, you know, dribble and all these sorts of things and you get nothing in the midfield defensively. I think he's a player that can, we're still learning to see what type of player he is in a midfield three, but, or a midfield four, but the, the difficult thing in here is that it doesn't help when you're constantly changing formations, you're constantly changing managers, you're rotating players in and out. He hasn't been getting, getting that consistent runtime that you'd expect of a young player in this project that is emphasizing youth to get. So if he's able to get those minutes, again, midweek against a team like Spal at home, maybe there is some comfort taken in the fact that he's playing off a guy like Ibrahimovic, as you mentioned, uh, Anthony, where it seems as though everyone's gravitating to Ibrahimovic and raising the stakes and raising their game to his level. I think that would be a good little test to see what you have in Paqueta. But I think regardless, based off what I've seen in reports about the fee coming in from PSG, they're looking to, to offer 20 to 25, and they're not moving off that. You can't get a loss on a player that quickly uh, after one year when you really haven't seen what type of player he is in a stable environment and in a consistent formation. You just can't do that. 
Yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, that's actually a good transition into what the next thing I was going to say mentioning the sale is um, we got a, a question from at the Milan fan. I'm not even going to try and pronounce your last name either. Um, it's another tough one for me. But he said, why did the management sign Kai, Kair, Kaiger and Begovic? Uh, doesn't this look like the cheap transfers from the previous decade that ruined and downgraded Milan after the 2011 season? So, yeah, I mean, go, going into transfer rumors, things like that. What do you guys think the game plan is with these new signings? Me personally, I think it leads into the rumored sale. Um, I, I think that would explain why we're we're cutting wages, we're selling dead weight, and we're bringing in people on six month deals, low wage, um, that are just going to be here to basically take up a spot. You know, in case we we have a depth issue, an injury crisis, something like that. I think they're there to fill in that gap, and they're probably not going to get much playing time. If they do, then great. You know, we could always sign them permanently, but I, I, I don't foresee that happening. And I think it's basically just to put a Band-Aid on, on the wound right now and see what happens moving forward with the sale. But um, do you guys think that that's what this is? Do you think it's a different strategy? Do you think this is a bad thing that's happening? I never thought about the two correlating the other, um, only because I don't know what to think about the sale. I feel like every hour it's like, oh, it's happening. Oh, it's not, you know, um, obviously – the Louis Vuitton group is going to deny it for multiple reasons. Um, but I think that we are trying to thin out the books because a lot of these players came um, during the Yong Hong group. Um, and honestly, they're on pretty high wages for just riding the bench. I think isn't Borini on, Borini on like three and a half a year or something ridiculous. I think, I think yeah, he's he on was a, like two, two and a half. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Either like way, that. that's ridiculous. Which is a lot. Um, yeah. You know, um, and so I think we're just cutting the dead weight and saving some money. So this summer, when we really try and go out and get some players, we have more room for wages, um, and it's not taken up all by players like Borini. Yeah, I, mean, I also get... think it was. I'm sorry, you go. You finish, Anthony. No, go ahead. I was just going to mention the wages again. <laughs> I, well, I think, you know, on, on the same topic of the wages, I think what's also fascinating, too, is that you have essentially two players. I'm not going to talk about uh, Lucas Belio, who's obviously going to run out his contract. He's another one who's getting paid a ton of money. He's on his last six months, and he's going to go for free. Um, but I think it's also very fascinating to see how the next six months go for uh, one, Bonaventura. Um, obviously, he's going to be uh, out of contract in the summer. How they... <laughs> They, do they let his contract run out and they say, okay, we're just going to completely try and just kind of start fresh with maybe six, seven guys that we, we want to start with. Um, and the same thing with number two with Donnarumma, right? I think that's such a very key talking point because you have to consider that they're shedding so many wages that with the expectation that should they have this takeover or should they want to continue on with Donnarumma, they're going to have to increase his wages. There's no way, there's no shortcuts around that. If they want to keep Donnarumma and extend him dealing with Raiola, they're going to have to increase from $6 million. So what does that become? Seven? Eight? You have to accommodate that by getting rid of Pepe Reina, Borini, possibly Ricardo Rodriguez, Lucas Bilio, which, say what you will about the additions, the transfer periods that Milan have had recently, they've done a good job of letting go of the guys like Montalivo and Montari, Poli, all these guys who have had no business being on this team. So with all that in mind, getting back to the main question about Begovic and uh, Kajir, I think the, the the interesting thing with that Milan fans have to kind of understand in this situation is that they want Milan to get winning players. They want Milan to be back to where they are, but they also are in a position where they understand that Milan can't splash the money because what are you going to do? Splash 30, 40 million or on two players um, that for a manager like Pioli who may not be here in June, like think of everything when it comes to the tire situation at Milan. You're not going to splash the money when you spent $70 million on two players in January last year who could be gone now. You could take losses on them. Like Caldara, you're probably taking a loss on already now, assuming he comes to form at Atalanta and he's healthy and they pick up his option. So I think Milan fans, and generally speaking, with all the additions that they make in January, there's going to be some where you hope that they have, regardless of who the manager is, regardless of if there's a takeover, or regardless of Elliot, you'll keep, keep hold of this thing. That they're gonna, you expect at least a few of them to have a role moving forward. But guys like Begovic, I'm not gonna cry about a guy who's gonna be here for six months and who's gonna be just a backup for Donnarumma. Pepe Reina didn't play at much of anything the couple years he was with Milan. So for people to be like, 
this is an outrage. Why are they getting these guys? They're seeing out the rest of the season. They don't have Europa League. You have the Copa Italia and the, the regular season. Like, if people, I could understand the outrage over some additions and things that Boban and Maldini have and have not done. But shedding weight, getting players to fill, the, fill your roster is not the top of my list of things to be crying about. The things I'm going to be crying about is if they overstretch their budget on players um, to try and you know, make one last step at, the, at, at a Champions League spot. They don't make it. Now they're stuck with a depreciating asset. And I think that's kind of what crossed their mind with Politano is that, look, he's 25, 26. We're not going to help a direct rival you know, get, you know, free up some space to get a guy like Erickson, Vidal, Giroud, or you know, whoever they want to get, Ashley Young. Like, we're looking at this in a, in a six-month vacuum. And how can we better our situation for the rest of the season and going into the offseason where we can have that flexibility? We can maybe entice some other players. We're not strapped with these big, uh, big wages and things like that that have otherwise hindered Milan with financial fair play. And, of course, in getting other additions, because if you're trying to free up space here for a guy like Modric, for instance, or a guy like Rakitic in the summer, you have to expect to pay handsomely for them. So I think they're thinking in the long term uh, about moves that are not going to really hinder the long term of the project and possibly a sale. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're spot on with clearing up the wages. You look at the players we've gotten rid of. Uh, Madison, you mentioned Barini on two and a half million. Reina, I think, was on like three point eight, something crazy like that. For five appearances, his entire career with us, that's insane. Um, who who else just left? Caldara, he was getting like two and a half, something like that. So between the three of them, we're looking at eight million in wages cleared up. And then you bring in the two guys here that are on really low wages. So between the two of them and, and Zlatan, basically we cleared up five, four and a half million maybe. So, I, I mean, I, I think it's great business. Like you said, for, for all those reasons, they're, they're people that aren't going to have a huge role in the team that there's no reason to complain about. Begovic is not going to see much point in time at all. If anything, he's there to be a mentor for Donnarumma, which is basically what Reyna was there to do. And he could only get better because of it. Um, obviously, I don't I don't know much about Kai, Kai, Jir, Kai here. Um, he may play, he may not. But it, it doesn't sound like we're done searching for another center back. It doesn't sound like we're done searching for a new winger, you know. Um, obviously, this Politano suso swap is – or I'm sorry, Paul um, – who are we trying to swap with Politano? Kessie. Kessie, yes, yeah, I, I don't think that's going to happen. It looks like Politano is now going to Roma um, for Spinaziola, which actually, in my opinion, is a great deal for Inter. But that doesn't exclude us going for, for uh, under from Roma, you know, swapping Suso with him, things like that. We're still going to make moves for players. Um, so I, I don't think this is anything to worry about. Like you said, Matt, there's a lot of fans getting up in arms about it. And, and it really doesn't matter. Um, there are a lot of rumors coming day in and day out. I mean, we had one on, on the site yesterday talking about Lingard. Obviously, he hasn't done much in 2019 at all, so that might not be the best. But that, that's another name that's coming up. You know, we're, we're seeing names every single day coming up. We know Bobin and Maldini are, are, are working hard, so I don't think well, there's any reason too. That's another one that's kind of yes, doesn't Jerome seem like it's going away. That's, that's one that I personally would love. Um, I've seen multiple I think that team needs it. that pedigree. World exactly. Cup winner, there's one at Bayern Munich. Uh, the wages are going to tell everything. And I think, again, back to what I was saying previously, clearing up the wages. I think that's what, with Milan's situation, the financial fair play and over the past handful of years, I think fans are a little bit more in tune about the impact of, like, okay, yeah, wait, how much are we paying in a transfer fee, but what are we paying the guy mm -hmm. with the length of the contract? I think fans are starting to kind of get more in tune with that. And I think ultimately what you see what they're doing January is that maybe they're freeing up something for a guy like Boateng on a one- or two-year deal with the, of wages that are, are reasonable. But Because you could see, in the summer, they, they, they bought youth, youth, youth. And then all of a sudden, they found that the youth can't shoulder all this pressure. So what do they do? They get Ibrahimovic, who's won everywhere. Now, all of a sudden, they're possibly thinking of a guy like Politano, 25-26. They're thinking of maybe Boateng, who's experienced, who has won at Bayern Munich, who has won with Germany. So they're starting to change their tune and they're trying to understand that we can't just strictly have kids go out there and play, guys. Let's see what happens because you're not going to get your objectives. You're not going to where you want to be. You need sort of veteran a balance between veterans and youth in order to make this thing work while also you know, understanding the fact that you can't just break the bank on a guy like Boateng because there are, it is an injury record to – take into consideration and you don't want to strap yourself down with high wages on a player who's way past his prime. It's almost like Paul Singer is just playing a FIFA 
career mode and wants to have all this youth to develop, you know. And <laughs> but the thing is, though, but the thing is, is that so Elliot Elliot owns Lille and Milan. But if you've looked at the quotes, I think maybe you guys even posted. I think it was like a screenshot of it. The the dynamic for which Elliot owns Milan and and Lille are completely different. I think Lille is strictly a team that we're getting youth. We're treating it almost like as if it's a business. We're developing talent, and then we're going to sell them off. They did it with Pepe. They did it with a bunch of different players. They did it with Leao, too. I think what Milan, it's a one of a different case where they're trying to build up Milan because mm-hmm. Milan are in a very different, precarious situation where you got a stadium involved. you got all these different players. They're trying to rebuild a fallen giant, which is going to take a, a ton of time. But also, the end game is for Elliot to have that stadium secured, have the team in a position where the, the balance sheets look good, so that when you actually do get t- uh, uh, possible buyers, again, could be Louis Vuitton. I think it's just, I laughed hearing about the fact that we could have like LV prints, printed jerseys. <laughs> but um, ha- the fact that you have all this together with the commercial opportunities, it it like it all makes sense. Like th- Ali's been tweeting about it uh, uh, at length on Twitter, and I I there's something to this. And I don't think again what we're seeing these next six months, I think that's kind of leaning in that direction where. Maybe the takeover is coming a lot more quicker than, than normal. But at the time being, you still have to try to at least make your objectives and be a little bit more appealing when you do get those buyers coming in to present offers because it doesn't look good when you're finishing 12th, 13th, and you're trying to, if you're Elliot, trying to get max value for your for your asset. Yeah, I mean, right. you look at yeah. the money that they've they spent, obviously, financing the Chinese move, and then the amount that they've put in since taking over, they have to make more than that to, to profit. So it benefits them to clean house, you know, reduce their expenditure over the next six months if, if this deal's coming that soon. Also you know, get good with UEFA. Great. Exactly. Yeah, they, they want to be in their graces. The new owner wants them to be in the, their graces. I mean, we have to. Bottom line is we, we can't afford to play hardball with financial fair play. We're going to lose every time. You know, we're we're not one of the clubs that can get away with it. Um, but, you know, we actually have a good question about that. So before we go and deeper in it because i think that's what we're going to do anyways might as well get this on there it's from christian espinosa at purple buckets he said i don't uh, i don't know what to believe with the louis vuitton arnold deal do you think they have had actual discussions with Milan about purchasing the team one day i see deal is closed the next day i see they never spoke about it and matt you basically just touched on that right now there's a lot of back and forth going on about it um one thing that most people seem to not pay attention to is Louis Vuitton has a real financial stake in keeping these negotiations hush hush. You know, they they have the stock market. They have uh, shareholders to to keep happy. And when you announce that you're going to be buying a billion euro asset, that's going to reduce your stakes because now you're, you're spending some of those. So, but is Louis Vuitton buying the asset or is Arnault buying the asset? Well, it'd be the Louis Vuitton Monet Hennessy Group. So it would be the entire okay. conglomerate. That so, is, so it Yanko, wouldn't be, um, be, yeah, okay. Yeah, all, all the big, big watch brands, fashion, everything. I mean, Louis owns it all. So, uh, here's here's the thing with the, the whole takeover thing, and I, I think it kind of aligned with how Milan have tried to conduct themselves under Elliot with Balban with Maldini on the transfer side. A lot of for which the activity that Milan have have undergone has been very more or less hush hush. I think there's, they've, they've tried to kind of keep things behind closed doors on the transfer side of things. They try to avoid things going leaking to the public for, for obviously uh, multiple reasons. And, and again, if you're Louis Vuitton, for the reason you just mentioned, Anthony, again, for the stakeholders, all those things involved as a publicly traded company. So I, 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 I agree that there's definitely something to this. Uh, would it surprise me if Elliot gives it another year? No. But I think at the same time, the six months are really going to tell. It's going to be very a telling time to see where Milan finishes, how players are performing, you know, how th- how the the stadium comes into play because that's also something that again will will come will be a big factor. Um, but there's definitely something to this. I, I wouldn't if I if I'm a fan just you know you know answering the question, I wouldn't read too mu- too much into it and kind of get caught up in it. Is it done? Is it not done? Yet I think it's one of those things where it's a very complex situation that fans should kind of keep an eye on. Obviously, you guys do a great job of uh, you know, going through the news, you know, giving you giving the, the, the reader the source um, and, and kind of giving you guys a full picture. But I don't think fans will look so much into 
when's it done? When's it going to be done? As opposed to that it's a possibility that it could happen sooner than fans probably expected um, with it possibly being the summer. There's, there's definitely something to this, you know, for them to come out and deny a rumor. Most clubs wouldn't make mention of any sort of transfer rumor if it's bogus. So the fact that they're coming out here and saying there's nothing to this. And then you have, I think I saw something um, with the sun or something like that, had like a direct message. He kind of came out and was like, this is pretty ridiculous. He's speaking on it. There's something to this. Uh, whether or not it's done now is irrelevant, in my opinion, at least in the time being. But it wouldn't surprise me, again, if it does pick up steam towards the end of the season uh, and, and heading into the summer. Yeah, I mean, there, there were some, um, I guess, people coming to be in the know that said that they had, you know, actual paperwork of the discovery process, which is a something that has to happen in every um, takeover. So if that's true, then clearly there's discussion, but he's not going to show that. Um, another thing, like you said, the the son denied it on his Instagram story. He even posted the picture of the uh, initial tweet that I said, think, you I think know, it was that, like Luca Serafini or something was the guy, yeah, the journalist exactly. who kind of broke the news. Yeah. Yeah. And, and granted, yes, he is big in Milan, but he, he's not like one of those world renowned sources. So the fact that he was even looking for that type, type of stuff tells me that he's like, okay, we got to keep this hush hush. I'm just going to find everything and just say no. You know, every summer with transfers, takeovers, anything football related, there's crazy rumors. You know, when when a club is linked with, say, Messi by by some random source, it's unbelievable and everyone knows it. So the club's not going to acknowledge that. But when they start saying, no, no, we're, we're not negotiating for him, then all of a sudden they are. You know, I mean, we, we saw it all the time with Galliani. He'd say, oh, we're not doing that. This will never happen. And then a month later it was done. So there's always fire where there's smoke. And it just, I think there's something to it. Like you said, it doesn't matter if it's done now or not. You know, some rumors are saying they want it done by June. Some are saying it is done. Uh, that that doesn't matter. What matters is if it's happening at all. Because even if they are deep in negotiations, at any point that could break down and nothing could come of this. So there's no reason to get your hopes up right now. You don't have to worry about spending $800 on a, on a Louis Vuitton Milan shirt. It's not going <laughs> to happen right away. Um, but if it does happen right away, I will go. Yeah, I'll go bankrupt. I'll buy it. But but uh, here's the thing too is that you know it, you know getting back to and I don't want to go too much into it because I'm sure we got other questions. But if you're looking to take over a club like Milan, right, Italian club, and your know, fashion capital of, of the world, and all these sorts of things that come into play, where you look at you, you think of the commercial opportunities, right? Your Louis Vuitton and the people that head the Louis Vuitton brand, you. You kind of can't just sit back, right? Because if it's if it's getting out into the media and it kind it does spread and there it does pick up steam, then it it's it's gonna have an effect on perhaps Louis Vuitton's stock, their their image, their future value, everything that you mentioned, Anthony, with them being a publicly traded company. So it's also fascinating. Look, and publicity, whether it be good or bad, is a good thing. It always tends to be one of those things where now Louis Vuitton, okay, they're linked with Milan, and then people have the articles that come out, people. Think of the possibilities commercially. They think of the the, the mock-up you know, uh, jerseys and all those sorts of things, the players that Milan can buy, right? I mean, we, we even saw that in um, once it was first mentioned that, oh, uh, Arno envisions Pep Guardiola as the coach. Like, you see how things kind of gravitate to it once it kind of gets out in the public. So I, I, I'm not looking too much into it myself. I'm monitoring, again, the, the sources I do trust. I know uh, Vito is a great one. I know Nicholas Shearer is a great one. I know you guys, what you guys are doing um, is, is fantastic in terms of covering it. But I don't think fans should be kind of putting a timeline on when it should or shouldn't be done. But more fact that they should consider it a possibility and something that may, or, that may be real. Exactly. It, I, feel like with, I feel like with, if it's going to happen, it's going to be sooner than we think. Um, I don't think it's going to be drawn out. I think Elliot won out. I think they're in o- over their heads and they were not expecting this. Um, they didn't realize how in shambles this club was or what it takes to work in Italy. I feel like it's pretty hard to do business in Italy. And Arnault, like Matt said, is or Milan's the fashion capital of the world. He's the fashion king of the world. You know, it just goes hand in hand. Um and I hope we get the stadium deal. Um, it sounds like if it doesn't happen, it's not going to go through. But I feel like Elliot won't let that happen. Um, they're in their business to make money. And unfortunately, in football, you don't get into football to make money. Um, if you guys read Soccernomics, you learn that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, 
they're in over their head and they're drowning pretty quick. Matt, you're on mute. I'm oh, sorry. Most of the top <laughs> clubs, yeah, soccer, soccer, soccer not, like I said, I know you touched on that. Most of the clubs are not profitable. But if you look at the actual revenues and the, and, and the balance sheets for most of the top clubs, they're not profitable. They're there to – it's a more of a – it's like a trophy, right? If you're an owner yeah. and you, you're you this billionaire, you want to like, oh, look at my team. We're winning trophies. We're at the top yeah. of the world. And that's yeah. one of those things where with Elliot, they have no business and they have no desire to be in, in football long term. They took over. They're kind of trying to in, you know, get their asset back to where it is and it is and should be. And then they're looking to flip it. The stadium comes into play. They're looking to obviously. I think the Emirates deal could be kind of being finalized. I know that's being talked about too with the sponsorship. So they're trying to kind of again position themselves to sell this thing sooner rather than later. So with that in mind, the fact that there is links to Louis Vuitton, there's 100% something there. Now whether or not it's going to happen, you know, in June or whatever the case may be, that time will tell. But. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be fascinating to see. And it's, for better or for worse, Milan always seem to be kind of in news and in the media. So um, we, you know, what better to have Louis Vuitton kind of just kind of fronting everything in the media and, and kind of leading the charge, right? You know, the fact that there could be possible, again, Louis Vuitton printed jerseys sold for $600. Is, I'll probably <laughs> buy them. So they'll, they'll be doing yeah. good there. But uh, mm. yeah, it's, 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 this is crazy, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, um, just to build off that, you you mentioned, you know, going into football, it, it's like a trophy to say, look what I won, you know, look what my team's doing. It's for the billionaire's ego. Um, Arnold is the second richest man in the world, and he's only behind Jeff Bezos by like a billion and a half, which is still obviously an astronomical amount of money. Oh <laughs> but when you're buying a billion dollar um, valued company, that automatically boosts your, your, your net worth there. And no billionaire is not egotistical. Obviously, I don't know the man, but he's clearly got an ego if he's the second richest in the world. The fact that he could buy this and become number one, that's got to be enticing to him, regardless it's of the footballing aspect. Want, like, yeah. I mean, I know I would want that. Like, I, I want to go up a little bit too, you know? So um, I fully get it. It may not happen, but th there's a possibility. There's something definitely going on. But to get off topic, one last question before we wrap up here. This one comes from um, AC Scotia. Uh, he says, who is the worst center back you've seen in a Milan shirt? Uh, I'll let you guys start with that. Madison, you go first. Nah, I can't do this right on the spot. I got to think about it. <laughs> That's why I uh, put it to you guys. A worst center. This, this one's very tough. I mean. Yepes? Wasn't he a center back? No, no, no. He's it was good. Yepes. Yepes was good. He had his role. He was like a fourth, fifth center back. Um. I'm fourth, gonna say, fifth center back. Yeah, but he was a fourth thing. He, but he was like he was at the tail end of his career. He was at the tail end of his career, yeah, and he did right. a job. He had the, he had the match winner against um Lecce, the comeback with Boateng yep. having I think three or four goals. Yeah, he had, the, he had the match winner there. But um, I'm going to say uh, Rodrigo Ely. Ah, that was gonna be mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know there's so many guys. If you gave me a fullback, like mentioned, it would probably be like Mesba. I would say like or yeah. Constant or Tewo maybe. But Manuelson. <laughs> Oh, uh, Avangioni, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one, yeah, because how many appearances did he have, like, 0. 0.7? I mean, I don't think the guy even played a full 90 ever. He... No, you know, that's, it was a free transfer. That was just another mess. Yeah. <laughs> that was, to go back to an earlier question we had, that was a transfer that had no direction that was just kind of done to be done. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's what's going on now. But, yeah, as far as worst center backs, man, I mean, you basically named every single one, <laughs> so one of those. <laughs> Honestly, you could probably make a case, Caldara, right? You made forty yeah. million, played two games. Mm, gone. Yeah, I, I saw in terms tweet. of business, you could make a case that it was the yeah. worst one. We I haven't seen him play, so we, for as we know, yeah, he, yeah, he never never had an appearance with us outside of the cup, I believe. Correct, or was it or Europa, Europa League? League? Or maybe it was one of them. League. Yeah, oh. um, and yeah, I know he made two official appearances, and neither were in the league, but. I saw a tweet. It said uh, Milan took 40 million euros, turned it into Benucci, turned yeah, Benucci into Iguain and Caldara. All three are now back at their original clubs, and Milan still doesn't have 40 million euros. So, um, yeah, that was a bummer to read, but it's funny and true. <laughs> uh, any closing thoughts, guys? I think that, that about does it for us. Um, no, I think uh, look, Milan. They've they looked at one of the better performances of the season, of course, on the weekend. Um, Against Cagliari, they got to kind of pick up this momentum. Hopefully, they go on one of those, again, those, you know, signature runs of theirs where they look good defensively, they look sharp in the midfield, they start scoring goals, which has been a huge uh, problem for Milan. Um, and, yeah, let's let's hope that Milan are in, in a position the next time, I guess, I'm on. 
um, if you guys do invite me back on, uh, to uh, be a little bit more hopeful about Milan's uh, direction. I think at this point in time, Milan fans want to see Milan headed in a, a positive direction. They're tired of hearing, uh, we're restarting, we're blowing the project up, we're overhauling the squad. They want to they wanna see progress with this project, and um, fans deserve it. The fans deserve uh, the results. The fans deserve something to be happy about. They show up every game. Um, they're supporting on Twitter. They're buying the jerseys. They're buying the Ibrahim. They're coming to Costa Milan to welcome all the players. It's time for the club to you know, repay that trust and, and produce and give Milan fans something to be happy about and cheer about. I think that's a great way to wrap it up, so we'll end it on that. Madison, hang on, get a hang chance. on, hang <laughs> on. <laughs> Line up for Spall and prediction. Oh, um, yeah, I think 4-4-2. I think we'll see some youth players in there. Um, probably Gabia over Musacchio, maybe. And I think that'll kind of be the only big change. Maybe Krunich in there. Conti, and probably, maybe. Yeah, Conti. Conti. And uh, Piontek might, might get a, a nod, but... Oh, and Antonio Donnarumma, because I, I just don't think Begovic is going to be match fit mm-hmm. a day after signing. And, God, I think, honestly, I think we're going to struggle a little bit until we bring on Ibra, and then we're going to crush him like 3 nothing. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go 2-0 Milan. I think they'll, they'll, they'll win a game that's uh, comfortable for the fans, give um, you know the fans something to kind of you know, ride into the, into the weekend fixture against Udinese, who... Although, again, they're not in the greatest position in the table. I think Udinese, they won 3-0 on the weekend against Sassuolo at home. So they do have some players that... They're always that team at a 6.30 start that I always feel like we always play and we always struggle against. So I'm very cautious about that. So hopefully Milan can get a good victory midweek. Everyone's, uh, most importantly, um, no one gets injured. Everyone's fit going into that game on Sunday. And then we can just mash Udinese and kind of keep this thing going. I'm going to go 2 0 with Leal Brace. Um, oh, man. Udinese <laughs> score lines. I know AJ and I talk about this every early game. We always wake up and we always lose. Yeah. We yeah. always lose. Every time. I'm not we even going to go to bed, actually. And actually won. And I think Rodrigo DePaul came on off the bench and got an assist and we lost the game 1 0. Like, yeah. That's a midfielder I'd love with. to sign. Yeah. I would love no. to sign him. He's incredible. Yeah, every time uh, I wake up early, though, we don't win. So my plan is Saturday, I'm going to stay up. Uh, that Conor McGregor UFC fight. I was about to ask Saturday. if you were going to watch it. Go. I'm going to watch go. that. Just power through the night because the game starts at 4.30 in the morning for me. So uh, hopefully if I don't sleep, it's a win. We'll, we'll see. But I think 2-1 for that game will win that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback off that. I'm going 2-1 too. All right. Just because you're right most of the time, 2-1. <laughs> There you oh, go. This is the one we're going to lose. All right. Well, sounds good. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's been a, pl- a blast. Uh, Matt, thanks again so much for joining us. Always Thanks a pleasure having, having you on the show. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Torgard45. Uh, Madison, sign yourself off. Then, Matt, go ahead after. Yeah, you guys can find me on Twitter at Madison underscore DT. And if you don't know, we are now doing a video podcast on YouTube, guys. So go check that out. And you guys can follow me on Twitter at Matt underscore Santangelo. Uh, thank you guys for having me back on. Thank you guys who are listening for supporting uh, my work. I really much appreciate it. And, um, yeah, if you guys have any questions for me personally, you guys can just send them to me on Twitter. I'll be more than happy to answer them uh, regarding the market, regarding uh, upcoming fixtures, certain players. And, yeah, like once again, thanks, to guys, for having me on. Perfect. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Enjoy yourself. Have a good night. Patrick, Patrick, mettila in mezzo Patrick, palla nostra, Suso, Suso, tira Alessio, Suso, tira, perché non tiriamo, ma perché non tiriamo, gol, Alessio Romagnoli, gol, Alessio Romagnoli, Alessio, il gol del capitano ancora, ancora l'ultimo, come Gilardino, detto ieri in conferenza.